On this episode of Signs of the Times, Apostle Tomi Ariomi on AI and global revolution. What does this emergence of digital technology mean for the future of the church? Tomi breaks down the purpose and the pitfalls of artificial intelligence and why Christians now more than ever need to rely on divine intelligence for the days ahead. Plus, what's ahead for the next seven years? Tomi reveals what God spoke to him on what we can expect from now until 2030. That and a whole lot more on this episode of Signs of the Times. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Signs of the Times, where we are talking about what God is saying in the prophetic now. I'm Pastor J. Anthony Gilbert, and I'm so excited that you have tuned in. Listen, this show is cutting edge because its purpose is to provide a prophetic and spiritual perspective of the days that we are living in and what lies ahead. There's so much going on in the world and there's so much happening. You know, you can tune into CNN, MSNBC, you can tune into all the different news stations, but you know what? This show right here is gonna help you have the spiritual lens that you need to have in order to understand what God is doing. In the midst of all the stuff that's happening in the economy, we take a look at stuff in the environment. There's so many things happening. What is God saying? Do you understand that God is on the throne? He's moving and he has a plan in the midst of everything that is going on. None of this is taken him by surprise. And what's amazing, he wants you to know what's on his mind and on his heart for this day and for this hour. So we bring together guests such as Tommy that are gonna come together and speak to us in the prophetic now. You know, you need to let everybody know, DVR this show, let everybody know that Signs of the Times is on because it's gonna speak to you and it's gonna alleviate fears, it's gonna elevate your faith, it's gonna speak to you prophetically. Healings, deliverances, breakthroughs, insight can all happen on Signs of the Times. And so I'm so excited because I believe this show is tailor-made just for you. And our guest here, Tommy, is a prophet to the nations. He's featured on mainstream media, including the BBC, Revelation TV, and TBN. He is recognized for his national and personal prophetic accuracy. Tommy is a governmental prophet, and he's had the privilege of consulting prophetically with leaders of nations in their homes and at the United Nations and in Parliament. Tommy, I'm so glad to have you here on Signs of the Times. Well, thank you for having me, Pastor Jay. It's real great to be with you and your amazing team. Praise God. Well, listen, we're going to jump right in on it. And I'm so glad that you're here. And I know that our guests are excited to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. You know, I know that you recently moved to America. Can you talk to us a little bit about what happened? Because I believe that you are a prophetic voice for such a time as this. You didn't come to say something. You came with something to say. And God has positioned you here in America for such a time as this. Why did God move you here? Amen. Well, um, the move to America officially happened maybe about five or six months ago, uh, but we've been ministering and pioneering in the U.S. for almost three years, just working in and out of the States. But I really believe that the Lord brought us to America to ready a people for the harvest that's coming. We all know that uh, around the world, people are talking about the billion soul harvest. It's been prophesied everywhere. Uh, but nobody's talking about the billion soul seed or the billion soul harvesters. Somebody's got to pick up the bill and somebody's got to wash the dishes. It's a great meal that's coming. It's a great harvest that's coming. But the Bible says the harvest is already ready. We don't need to pray for the harvest. We need to pray for the workers. We need to pay, pray for the people who are going to work in two areas, according to Cyrus. The first area is the area of workers who are qualified apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, reapers of the harvest, especially the shepherding anointing. Second area is who's going to foot the bill, who's going to wash the dishes. The gospel is free, but the means by which the gospel is spread is not free. And so we need 
uh, workers. And so those are the reasons the Lord, uh, I believe, fundamentally has brought us to America. But one of the things the Lord said to me was years ago when he brought me here initially, America was the most frequented country I've been to. And he said, I have brought you here for the re-evangelization of the church. And that was a, a heavy word that lay on my heart. So that's those are the many reasons the Lord has brought us here. You mentioned re-evangelization of the church. Can you break that down a little bit deeper? I don't want to just skim over that. You said something very profound there. What does that mean? Well, the evangelist is sent to the lost souls. The apostle and prophet is sent to the lost sheep. Jesus said, I did not come for the Gentiles, but rather for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So you can actually be a lost sheep. And whenever God sends prophets, he says, I'm not sending you against the people of foreign tongue or another nation. I'm sending you against your own people. And so before a prophet is for you, God actually sends them against you to tell you how far uh, the standard is dropped from where the Lord wants a nation to be and where a nation is. And that doesn't make a prophet better than the people that they're sent to, nor does it put in them an elitist inclination, because every prophet from the beginning of time said, I too am a person of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. So God has to consecrate the prophet first. The message through you has to come to you, and it has to hit you first. And then God sends you out and releases you to the sheep because the, the lost souls have no hope until the lost sheep become found again. Do you think there weren't a time like where John the Baptist was? Uh, he made straight the way of the Lord before Christ came. You mentioned about the billion soul harvest, but you mentioned about the seed and how that has to be sowed first. Do you believe there weren't a time where the spirit of John the Baptist is coming back to the body of Christ to equip and to develop for this appearing of this revival that's getting ready to happen? I certainly believe that. I believe that before there is a coming of the Lord, there has to be a release of the mantle of Elijah. And, and that comes again in the spirit of John the Baptist. I believe it's it came in Kings, it came in Matthew, in Jesus' day, and it's coming again before the coming of the Lord. We're going to see a release of the mantle of Elijah. And, you know, Elijah just means God is he. And so when God releases that mantle again upon the earth, it prepares a way for the coming of the Lord. It makes ready. The Bible says it does two things. It says it makes ready a way and it makes ready a people. It says prepare a way for the Lord, but another place it says prepare a people ready for the coming of the Lord. And so there's got to be a people ready. There's got to be a way ready. We often don't remember this, but many of the disciples from John followed Jesus. And so John actually did the warm-up work. John did the, the, the main preparation, getting them ready for the one that was to come after. And those disciples followed Jesus. And John's response was, I must decrease that he must increase. And so, you know, going back to what the spirit of Elijah actually represents, it represents a restoration of the hearts of the fathers back to the sons and sons back to fathers. It heals an orphan spirit. And, you know, Pastor Jay, sadly, I actually think that the orphan spirit has played out more in the clergy than it has in the people. You know, we have a lot of, you know, in America, I, and sadly in Nigeria as well, we have a lot of mega churches that are really in the spirit. You look at them, they're mega orphanages led by orphan, orphan fathers and orphan mothers who take the, the, the broken and then they fix them. And the sign of the orphan spirit is you take the broken, you fix them. And then when they're fixed and they no longer need you, you have to break them again. And so that never ending cycle of abuse is uh, sadly between orphan people and orphan leadership is, is what we need to break in the nations because the church has to be a sending place again. And to be a sending place, there has to be a security on the inside of the leader that knows I'm actually training you to make myself redundant. I'm equipping you to leave me. 
And sadly, you know, I have so many pastors come to me for, come to us for training and they say, all our people are growing and they're going to do great things. And it's like, well, that means you, you've actually done your job. You've put something in them that helps them to mature, helps them to grow. And, uh, but on the other side, we have to teach the, the saints about faithfulness and about the fact that, you know, you don't fire your fathers, you don't, you don't get rid of your mothers, you don't just throw them away, but there is still a role for two generations to run together. You know, Tommy, do you think that the uh, seeker-friendly church, using your words, has become an orphanage and that the way that we've defined church growth that maybe God wants us to reassess it, what true growth looks like. I believe so. I believe there's always going to be a metric for spiritual growth in numbers. I believe that. The Bible says, in the multitude of people is the honor of a king. So there's always going to be that place, and we can't get rid of that. And I hear a lot of preachers say, we don't need, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. And actually, it's about both. Amen. You need size, and you need numbers because how else will God be honored and glorified except there be a multitude of people? Uh, but you also need quality. You need in-depth people. And sadly, I think the shallow growth metric of the church today across America is how do we grow numbers? And that's one thing the Lord told me to resist because he wants a people prepared for him. It's possible to worship what you don't know. It's possible to attend and not follow. You know, Jesus looked at a Samaritan woman and said, you worship what you don't know. And so we can have a seismic shift in our churches where every church has 20 to 30,000 members or 50,000 members. But the question is, what is being taught? Because if it's not the spirit and truth, we're in great danger. You know, one day the Lord said this, uh, that the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Across but and again, I'm speaking in pejorative terms, so I, I don't mean to stereotype, but across the Eastern Church, there's a general cry for the Spirit of God. There's not really a cry as strong for the truth. And so in the Eastern Church, there's a real signs and wonders. Well, the Bible says the Jews demand a sign, the Greeks demand knowledge. And so when, whenever I go to Africa, Asia, all of these countries, there's signs and wonders. That's the cry of the people. And so God meets the supply with signs and wonders. When I go to the Western church, it's knowledge, especially UK and Europe. They're very Greek in their mindset, their schooling system, education system. So what do they demand? Philosophy, the knowledge of the word, apologetics, theology. And so I find myself being more theologically inclined uh, in the Western church, more spiritually signs and wonders, miracle manifestation in the Western church. But Jesus actually said this, the true worshiper is not just going to worship in too much truth that they lack spirit or in too much spirit that they lack truth. The two wings of the plane are going to flow together hand in hand. Because when you have too much spirit, no truth, you can end up in witchcraft. And when you have too much truth and no spirit, you end up in religion. And so you, you just see that what God is doing in this final hour is he is bridging that gap by, by releasing a generation that go from teaching the word to demonstrating the word. And, you know, I think America needs to experience that. I believe any gospel void of the power of the Holy Spirit is an incomplete gospel. And any gospel void of the truth is an incomplete gospel. So we need both to work together. Well, let's talk about that because, you know, a lot of the church experiences that you have nowadays, they say everything's got to have a timer. It's got to have a certain amount of time. You can't go too long. But, you know, Tommy, one of the things I've noticed in the scriptures, any experience with God took time. Whether it was Moses that went yes. up there for 40 days to come down with the law, whether it was in the upper room where it took 10 days. I mean, you go on and on and on, wherever it is. Talk to us about the Nigeria experience and about the importance of tarrying because I think we've lost that art in the body of Christ. Why is that so important? Yeah. Well, you know, in Nigeria, we pray um, night vigils and day vigils, and prayer doesn't end till from it can go from twelve o'clock at night till seven o'clock in the morning, and uh, you're just praying through the nights. And so we are well versed in the African church in waiting on the Lord, and there is a huge uh, power surge of the Holy Spirit in Africa because we don't have infrastructure. And so faith is vital. 
when uh, I lived in Nigeria, the lights could switch off at any given moment. And some people can be in darkness for two days, a week, two weeks, no electricity, no gas, no water. And so in Nigeria, you actually have to buy a backup generator in every home. So when your lights go off, you just go out and crank that generator up and get it started. I remember when um, in my time in Nigeria, a, a very trusted friend and driver uh, who drove our, our vehicles for us, he passed away in, our, in my arms. And, you know, I had to work the faith to pray for him because there's no ambulance. There's no uh, a, a, a catheter. There's no ability to resuscitate them through medical means. So you have to work some muscles that are not necessarily worked in the West. And so the first time I saw a timer in a church was in America. Um, I, I remember just seeing this big red clock counting down like a demon. I, I now call it the demon of Kronos. In front of me, it was just going down, down, down. And, you know, 40 minutes is my introduction. And so usually when I see the timer gone down, I haven't even started my message by the time the clock reaches zero. And, you know, I, I've learned often that the Holy Spirit often shows up after the benediction. Hmm. And sometimes that's when people... Uh, during offering time is when you start seeing people rushing for the car and getting the kids ready and getting them out of the car park as quickly as possible. And the Lord told me, when you come to America, resist the seduction yeah. of, of, of church growth metrics that don't have depth. And the measurement of that was um, uh, a, a scripture in when uh, Mary came to a wedding feast and the wine had gone. And everybody else continued the party, but the wine had gone. And uh, it's interesting when you look at America uh, that the church can continue and the wine is gone. And, and it took one spiritual Mary to go, why are we having church without wine? Um, we can have great parties without the wine. We can have great church, lights, smoke machines, excellent, skinny jeans, pastors wearing leather jackets, being modern and all of this great stuff. But if the wine is gone, then the church has lost its essence. And so it took Mary to look at Jesus and say, they've got no more wine. And I believe the church in America is due the new wine. But part of the new wineskin, like I believe you're rightly pointing out, is there has to be a generation willing to tarry for the power. You know, we, we don't recognize this often, but the Bible says, wait in Jerusalem. You've got the training, you've got the discipleship, but you will be totally ineffective without the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't care how theologically apt you are. The gospel of Jesus is not in word, it's in power and demonstration. That's the only language the devil speaks, is the power of God. And without that power, the church in America is doomed. And so it's, but we have to learn to wait for it. We can't, we can't put God on the clock. Well, you know, Apostle, I think uh, there's something to be said about having an aged anointing. What makes a wine so valuable is how long it's been on the shelf. And we live in a day and hour, ladies and gentlemen, where we have people, Jesus took 30 years for a three and a half year ministry. Nowadays, we have a three and a half year training period for a 30 year ministry. We're wondering why people's characters are always falling apart is because the charisma can't be held up by their character. Never despise what God is building in a season like this. He's building you in this season so then your character can carry the charisma, the anointing, the gifting that he wants to put upon your life. This is the time that we don't need to seek after gifting. We've done that long enough. He wants to see fruit. And I believe we're going to talk a little bit more about this because in just a moment here on Signs of the Times, uh, we are going to talk about prophetically navigating AI and the digital revolution. And he's also going to talk a little bit more about the seven years that we need to get prepared for, that God has you right now in position, ready to receive. It's going to be awesome. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Cornerstone Television is dishing out all new episodes to fill your home with truth and joy this season. From Hope Today to Origins, Hard Questions, Sister to Sister, Today's Nashville, Move Your Mountain, and Dashing Dish. Taste the best of local Christian TV on Cornerstone Television Network, where hope happens. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are just getting started here and we're getting ready to go a little bit deeper because we're talking about prophetically navigating AI and the digital revolution. We're going to be talking about the next seven years. You know, Prophet Tomi had just been discussing about the importance of what true church growth really looks like in this season and about tearing and waiting. Ladies and gentlemen, there's something about waiting on God's presence. The Bible makes it clear in Isaiah. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I believe there's many of you watching right now that you are in a time of weariness and the Lord is saying to you that you're too busy. Some of you are too busy with ministry. Some of you are too busy with your job, with money, and God is calling you away in this season to get along with him. You need to restructure your priorities in this season. And I hear the spirit of the Lord saying that as you get along with him, he is going to begin to refocus you on what is important. And as you do, he's going to begin to renew your strength. He's going to renew your focus. And what took you five years will take you five months. What took you five months will take you five weeks, five weeks, five days, and five days, five minutes. God is getting ready to accelerate your life, but you're going to need his help. And there are many of you watching right now that don't understand that you have ran out of wine in this season and in order to see the church and to see your destiny and call get to where it's called to be you're going to have to go back to the source you've got to get back to Jesus he's not mad at you he's mad about you and he's ready to pour something new out upon your life he's getting ready to pour out a new weight of glory upon your life and he's ready to prepare you right now and I've got Apostle Tommy here with me. And you know, Apostle, you've talked about the next seven years between 23 and 2030, that this is a seed time that God is preparing us for something. Would you talk to the people that are watching right now about what the Spirit of the Lord is saying about these next seven years? Wow, well, yeah. So uh, during 2021, the Lord told me to tell the church that they have nine years left. And so I did uh, release this prophecy and I shared a, a couple of harbingers in that prophecy that were going to begin to take place during those nine years. And then uh, when the seven year window came in 2023, I saw the clock again, same vision of a clock. The Lord showed me it's spinning really fast and so fast that if my hand were to touch it, my hand would fall off and go round with the clock. And the Lord said, you can't change these next seven years, but tell them you have seven years left. After I shared that prophecy, you know, Joe Biden, uh, Kelly, uh, Secretary Kelly, all of these people started coming out on their podium. People sent me videos saying we have seven years left to prevent another world catastrophe. So it seems like God has a narrative of seven years and Satan has a narrative of seven years. And the two narratives are running symmetrically in line with each other, but they don't mean the same thing. You know, they're talking about a global warming. God is really talking about a global groaning, that there needs to be a people prepared for exactly what is going to hit the globe in seven years' time. And I know a couple of prophets have now started also releasing uh, videos and words around the year 2030, being another significant date on uh, God's prophetic calendar. And I'm just so glad to get to release this on your program, Signs of the Times, because I believe that's what you carry, that Issachar anointing to recognize when something needs to be spoken and shared across the nation. And so I believe this word is, is not supposed to put fear of, at least not fear of man, but definitely the fear of God yes. is meant to put on the inside of us. Somebody said to me, you know, Prophet Tony, you're just trying to make us afraid. And I said, yes, I'm trying to put the fear of God on the inside of you to get you ready, to get you mobilized, not to change the outcome, but to work with an outcome that is already designed in heaven. Just like Joseph, who had seven years left uh, to prepare for years of 
lack that were coming, one of the amazing pictures was seven cows who were skinny and gaunt eating seven cows who were fat. And I remember one of our prophets just saying, isn't it interesting how seasons can swallow seasons if the church isn't ready? And so I just thought that was such a powerful word. You can have seven skinny cows just swallow that entire season. And the Lord says for us to be ready so that seasons don't swallow seasons. So we're not caught up in the next seven years wondering what are we going to do now? Because what we should have done is listen to the prophets when they were speaking. The book of Ezekiel says, and God, I'm, I'm, I'm giving the message translation here. It says, you know, because I was giving prophecies over the nations from the Ukraine war, which the Lord showed me was getting ready to take place to a top secret document about a war going on between U.S. and China around 2025. And then we saw that Pentagon document release. So people started to send me messages. Every word you're saying is on the news like the next year or the next week. And I got frustrated in my spirit and I wondered what this internal fight was. Um, it wasn't an excitement with what people were excited over. People were excited with the words coming to pass. I was frustrated with the fact that God allows these signs to take place because he's trying to bring credibility to what's about to happen so that the church can take action instead of being excited. And so everybody was more excited about words coming to pass as uh, and not yet the fear of God saying, what can we do now as we see this calendar approaching? And so the book of Ezekiel says something interesting. It says, you've become to these people like a singer of love songs. Everybody gathers around you to hear the latest word of the Lord. And they gather as people do, but they will not do as you tell them to do. He says to them, you're just a well-dressed love singer. You're just a country singer to them. That's what the message translation says. But it says, but when these words comes to pass, and they surely will, they will know that a prophet of the Lord has been among them. And I, I believe that we don't have to wait. That was God's way of saying, I told you so. I believe we don't have to wait for the divine, I told you so. I believe we can preempt that quickly right now. And so the Lord showed me money as we know it was getting ready to change forever. Currency as we knew it was getting ready uh, to change forever within the next seven years. Also, that something with climate change was going to collide with political expediency to parcel democracy in a way that it still looked democratic, but it wasn't democratic. And that, you know, what we saw in 2020 with COVID was just a dress rehearsal for what was truly coming down the pike and what truly was the agenda. And the agenda from the beginning of time till now has always been to count because the one who can count has the control. God promised Abraham, your seed shall be as the sand of the shore, which cannot be numbered. And so we see throughout history, every time somebody tried to number something, God got angry. David tried to number, God sent an angel to slay all of them. Herod tried to number, babies were killed in the river. Why? Because God's promise is they cannot be numbered. We're getting ready to see through the digital era, a numbering, a census, and a part of that census is to call the people who are less intelligent, call the people who are less sophisticated and, and create an, a system of governance that uh, God tried to destroy in the Tower of Babel when they got together as one person and tried to build a tower to their own name and their own greatness. We're literally going to see the enemy try to reconstruct that because he has now the technology at arms to be able to do so. You know, Apostle, you just said a whole boatload of stuff right there. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you are truly yeah. taking this in. What he's sharing right now is truly the outlook of what is coming. You know, Apostle, as you're talking as well, uh, I'm sure many people probably have not heard this, and I know you have, about the new Amazon One that has come out and how they have now where you can go eat right here in, in Pittsburgh. They have two places in Upper St. Clair and also in Wexford at the Whole Foods where you can register on Amazon your credit card information. You've got all these things that you can do and you can use the palm of your hand. They read, I believe it is the vein structure of your hand. Everyone's is different and you put it over an infrared scanner and that's how you'll be able to pay for them. You can go do that 
right now. And I think a lot of people don't see how things are moving prophetically in an expedited rate. You know, you said this just a couple of minutes ago, uh, uh, Tommy, that, that how the time is speeding up. And you can see things just happening so fast, even with things like that. Uh, how do we get prepared for what's coming? We see the technology shifting. We see the currency thing happening. We see the environment. What do we need to do to get prepared in this day and hour? Oh, there's so much, uh, sir, I can say to that. But one of the biggest things I'll say is the church needs to get over its ambivalence. The Lord gave me this word a few days ago, ambivalence. I want to deliver the church from the spirit of ambivalence. And ambivalence is, in a word, ambivalence is not indifference, nor is it passivity. It's a mutual feeling of like towards something and a feeling of dislike towards it at the same time. It's like, a, I, I believe in this, but I don't believe in this. Like, I believe, but help my unbelief. It's that ambivalent place of possessing two opinions that God sent Elijah to say, how long will you falter between two contradictory and opposing opinions? And so there's an internal struggle within the bride of Christ right now when it comes to things like money. There's an ambivalence towards that. There's, this is just less spiritual. We can't talk about money in the church. we got to talk about souls and healing, miracles and revival. And the church needs to get over its ambivalence. I, I have lots of Instagram pages, Facebook pages, and YouTube pages that are made by scammers. And everybody, I can't tell you, Pastor, I don't know if you get this, how many calls and messages I get from people say, somebody, I just got scammed out of $30,000. I thought it was you. And I sold it to an orphanage that you had started. Uh, they didn't even read. I mean, I said to them, send me the message. And it had the most sketchy account number, account name wasn't even mine, sort code wasn't even mine. A spell on the site, and it usually starts with beloved, the Lord, the Lord is speaking a prophetic word over you. If you're so 30,000 today, blah, 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 this is going to happen. And one day I asked the Lord, why are, is the church among the most deceivable people on the earth? Why don't we get this? And the Lord said, because the church still believes everything is free. And anytime you hear that, I'm going to do this for free. This is coming for free. Give me your money and I'll put it in an account for free. There's a scam usually on the other side of that waiting to happen, you know, and the, the five foolish virgins go to the wise virgins and say, give us your oil because our lamps are going out. And he said, no, go and buy your own oil. And so look at the fools. What highlighted the fools was I always say fool is spelled F-R-E-E. -E. You know, anytime you have a free mentality, like this has got to be free. It can't cost me anything. You know, uh, I've got to be able to get a, a gospel bargain, a Christian bargain. Something can't cost me, you know, then you're really heading for deception because there's the only thing that's free is the blood. And even the blood isn't free. It costs God everything he had. And so people in the body of Christ don't yet know that. So the, the strongest message I can give is the church has to get over its ambivalence. Second thing is once it's got over its ambivalence, it's got to build Goshen. Goshen is the place where God reserved the children of Israel from the plagues of Egypt. Goshen is also the place where Joseph built the biggest farming and land and property industry that Egypt had ever known. But finally, Goshen is the place where Pharaoh said, let's deal wisely with the people and put banks on top of their stuff. And so Pithom and Ramesses were built in Goshen, two big banks, and people traded their houses for leeks and onions. Sounds a lot like today. You know, people gave their property to the bank. The bank gave them a mortgage that they couldn't pay. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, work for my system. And somehow we'll figure out a way to make you a slave without putting a whip behind your back and calling you kin to kente. But that's exactly where we are today. We're in that same place. And so the church has to become more financially sophisticated in a short period of time than it's ever been. And, you know, I know we're going to a break soon, but it cannot do it. I believe, without taking advantage of the very technology that's going to be used against them. I want to digress for just a minute because there's something that you've been saying, and I know we've got some, some other segments, but I want to hit this because I think this is so important. I think we're in a day and hour, uh, Prophet, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we are overdosing on the prophetic. And what do I mean by that? When you overdose on something, it means you've ingested more then you've had the ability to process. 
And I think a lot of people are wow. turning prophecy into fortune telling and we're ingesting all wow. of this prophetic stuff, but we're not processing it. We're not breaking it down and letting our body use it and allowing ourselves to use it. How important is it for us to steward the prophetic things that God has given, the things that he's speaking, that it can't just be, well, I heard this prophecy, I'm going to sit back and wait on something to happen. I believe those seven years were a stewarding time for those seven years in Joseph's life. And how well he stewarded those seven years was going to determine the following seven years of how well he was going to be able to stand. Can you talk to us a little bit about this overdosing of the prophetic and the importance of stewarding the things that God is speaking to us? I, I think you couldn't put it better, um, Pastor Jerry. I think we become so oversaturated with prophetic truth. You know, we're in a day right now where we can have more information at our fingertips if we try. Yeah. Back in the day, growing up, when you wanted information, you go to a library and you sit there for hours asking a librarian for a specific book. And if they had it in their library, they'd give it to you. If they didn't, they'd order it in from somewhere else. Today, you just click a, 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 a website yeah. and that information is readily available to you. And yet we're a dumber generation for it. We're, we're, we're more, we have more media and yet we have more social media and yet we couldn't be more antisocial even if we tried. We have more information and yet we couldn't be more, you know, dumbed down as a generation even if we tried. Because when you over-resource somebody, you make them under-resourceful. History has proven it, that the most under-resourced nations, I mean, whatever you want to say about the slave days, you know, I was from Nigeria, a lot of people were shipped out of Nigeria to different parts of the world during the slave days. No matter what you want to say about the slave days, the truth is you had an under-resourced uh, Western world who looked at an overly resourced Eastern world and took advantage with their under-resourcing they sent men over the ocean, sent men like Christopher Columbus to discover the, the, the world. And then people kept dying on the voyage. Why? But why do they keep sending people? Because they're under-resourced. And when you're under-resourced, you become resourceful. Nigeria is over-resourced. People say, but why is Nigeria so poor? Because it has too many resources. History is proven. Anytime somebody is over-resourced, they become under-resourceful. So same thing with the prophetic. If you oversaturate people, with prophetic words, you actually make them less resourceful. And sometimes you look at God, he gave 10 talents, five talents, two talents. Every time he depreciates your resources, he's actually, I mean, I'm sure you started this program by faith with not many resources uh, coming around you. But all of a sudden, you got really resourceful. You started to figure things out and God started to bless your resourcefulness with resources. But you look at people today, um, especially Amer America, look at America, overly resourced. What's happening when you're over-resourced? You become under-resourceful. You, you start raising children who become so entitled that they don't know how to stand on their own two feet. Same with the prophetic. Wow. Well, you know, and I think we're in a day and hour, Tommy, that, that we've lost our hunger. That drive is not there yes. because we've been oversaturated uh, with the prophetic. Yes. And I think God is going to hold us accountable that we've got to begin to steward this correctly. Otherwise, the price to pay will be very, very heavy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, don't go away. I know you've been blessed. I've been blessed just listening to this wonderful man of God. He's going to come back and he's going to begin to break down the purpose and the pitfalls of AI. You heard him just mention about how all of this is going on. Well, we're getting so much information on the tech and, and the, uh, uh, on the internet and everything else. There's so much that is at our fingertips. How can we use this in this day and the hour that we're living in? Because the body of Christ needs to be prepared for what is getting ready to come. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this. Do you have living water? Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, 
as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Are you dry? Are you thirsty? Are you in need of prayer? Call our prayer line or connect with us online. Well, we're here with the wonderful prophet, Tomi Ariomi, and I tell you what, it has been outstanding. And listen, I hope you've recorded this because you're gonna to wanna to go back. You're being fed with a fire hose today. And I tell you what, we are getting inundated with the prophetic vision of what God is getting ready to do. And you know, there's been a major uptick. If you've noticed, ever since 2020, when the 5G technology came out, I did several messages, even in our church, discussing the 5G technology, how it was setting us up for self-automated cars and even the tracking devices that they had, the COVID trackers and iPhones. And now we're progressing. We are getting ready. Listen to us clearly now. We are getting ready to see the greatest influx of knowledge coming forth and innovation with AI that we have ever seen. And I'm telling you what, this man of God is going to speak to you now about some of those things. You know, Prophet, you said something very profound to me about AI, that you can either use the tool or become the tool. I believe that's not only with AI, I think kind of the internet as a whole was kind of the uh, platform for that. But AI is a whole different beast, no pun intended, or maybe even all pun intended. Can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of how to utilize that tool and not become it? Yes, and it's scary because I guess social media has already become an addiction. I saw Tim Cook say something really interesting. He's like, I don't ever use my phone as much because I never intended people to use the phones as much as they use it. In fact, in Silicon Valley today, the number one rule of the kids, because the tech, the tech parents' kids go to school on Silicon Valley, and the number one rule in school is no mobile phones because they know how addictive it is. It's more addictive than cocaine. And so now we already have a church addicted to mobile phones. Let's just be real. We have a Christian church already addicted to mobile phones. I can't tell you how many times I see on the preach on the front row pastors more on their mobile phones than they are in worship. And so we we do. We have that generation. And unfortunately, myself, I, I can't help once in a while checking an email, looking at social media, checking out what's going on. So I fall into that unfortunate category as well. And I'm believing God for total deliverance because we need to be more connected to the spirit than we are to Wi-Fi. I think if the church could work that same muscle it uses to run into people's house, do you have Wi-Fi? Do you have Wi-Fi? Just take that moment to plug into what the spirit of God is saying. We would be so attuned to what he's doing in this hour. But technologies have changed the world. They've done great things for the gospel. And I have a couple of things that are examples of that. The Roman road was a piece of technology that helped Apostle John write those seven letters because all of those churches were along the same Roman road. And so think of the Roman road like the first World Wide Web but it was like real estate. It created networks and inroads that without those Roman roads, the gospel would not have gone around where it would needed to go to. The Gutenberg Press, which we all know helped Martin Luther spread the Protestant movement around the world, that without the Gutenberg Press, the Protestant movement, arguably, I would like to say, would have stayed in Germany and wouldn't have gone around the world like it has today, shaping people like us as uh, uh, mobile phones, social media. You know, what's interesting to me, I've been to I've been to major cities, I've been to villages, I preach in places where the congregants aren't wearing any clothes because they they just live their life that way. And so, but every one of them has a mobile phone. There are arguably now around eight billion people in the world today, by the last estimate I checked, 6 billion of them have a mobile phone, 6 billion. I mean, so no matter how poor you are in the world, you have a mobile phone. That means we actually have the ability right now to fulfill that Matthew mandate that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to every creature as a witness, and then the end will come. We have that capacity now. AI changes the game ever so scarily because it gives you a sense of uh, omniscience, omnipresence. It's really the first tech 
that can almost mimic God. And that's that's a scary statement to make in itself. And I've wow. I've been looking, doing a lot of research because the Lord gave me a word actually that this gospel cannot be preached without learning to use the tool of AI. So you don't become a tool of AI. And so I realized that uh, a lot of what AI helps us to do as a ministry, I we could actually help others to learn as well. It's just phenomenal things that AI can do that used to employ people to do, uh, that it saves that time. And also it gives you as a leader more time to focus on the word of God and prayer. Now, unfortunately, today, AI can help you actually make a sermon, which is scary in itself. I remember running this experiment and I actually got AI to write me a whole sermon and I preached it on my YouTube channel and everyone was so excited. And at the end of it, I said, by the way, this wasn't my message. AI made this message and people were stunned. Wow. And so I was doing that to show them the danger of AI replacing divine intelligence, replacing the place of the Holy Spirit. And we've seen churches right now, unfortunately, churches right now don't have good boundaries with AI. We, there's, the, I, I think it's in, here in America, we have the first AI church, which is a church entirely taught and led by artificial intelligence, which is scary in and of itself. But you think about what AI can do today. Um, pastors, every pastor, every leader of a church needs a website. AI can create your website in 10 seconds. Um, every uh, leader needs uh, video editors and people who can help them turn their social media into reels and posts on YouTube and all of that. Gone are the days where you have a huge team of people working that because AI can pretty much take this hour long video and break it down for you into reels, YouTube videos, Instagram posts, you name it, it's, it's doing it. AI right now, uh, gone are the days where you use MailChimp or all of those things to send thousands of emails out to your mailing list at 7 p.m. or at peak time for them to read it. Now AI can actually analyze individual data to find out what time an individual, let's say you have 10,000 in your mailing list and one person likes to open it at 3 p.m., the other likes to open it at, at 8 a.m. in the morning. It will actually pick up individual habits and send the email to individuals at the optimal time it knows they're going to read that data. I mean, it's just so many things that right now AI is doing to redeem time. The Bible says, let's make the most of every opportunity, redeeming the time because the days ahead are evil. And within this seven-year window, there's so much we can do with AI to actually redeem time. Apostle Paul said it like this, is it right for us to wait on tables when we got to give our greater attention to the word of God and prayer? I believe the optimal key to success in these next seven years is letting our leaders prioritize the word of God and prayer. No prophetic direction, we're all in trouble. And so he said, let's have some people who can do this so we can give our attention to, to the greater needs of the body. As we advance into this new season, I believe that question is upon us again. Do we want to be the people who are waiting tables, doing administration, too busy in ministry for ministry, or do we want to give that over and hand some of the menial tasks over to AI? Still doesn't replace people, by the way, because uh, AI still needs people, thank God, at least for now it does. But the sad news is I think we're coming into a day where it won't need people anymore. I think through machine learning, we're, we're already teaching AI so much about us that I actually saw the day where people were calling AI the second personality, like having a second person follow you around forever and just do stuff for you. So um, interesting, interesting days. But but uh, but the Lord was speaking expressly to me about the tool of AI. You know, I, I want you to talk just for a couple more minutes. Uh, we've only got a little bit left of this segment of this show here. But you know, artificial intelligence means artificial means almost real, and not allowing that to replace divine intelligence. You know, as you're talking, I felt the Holy Spirit drop something in my spirit. I remember when the internet first came out and the cell phones came out, 
and how we saw pornography and all that just rip through the church, rip through families. People are still battling with that. And something I think is real important is how do we establish appropriate boundaries? Now, it might be a little early for this, but, you know, because we're still learning it, but I think it's going to be very important that the church be on the cutting edge and understand how can AI become a, a web? It can become kind of like the World Wide Web and how people can get tangled up in that and in the AI in a way to where it can become unhealthy. And I feel if we can be proactive, uh, Prophet, about AI, we don't have to have the same pitfalls that we had like with pornography and online gambling and all these things. What do you have to say about that? What can we do to make sure we're healthily have boundaries? And then after that, I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to see your AI video, uh, the school that you're uh, releasing to be able to educate and help people with this. But I think that's so important that you speak to that. I think that my, my best answer to that is I think the church missed a moment of responsibility when the World Wide Web came out. We missed a moment to hold our leaders, our politicians accountable to make sure that certain things are restricted, prohibited, and certain things are allowed. We miss that moment. And I think with AI, we have an opportunity again to be part of the conversation. The sad thing is when things come out and they're new, there's no restrictions around them. You know, when the automobile came out, there was no real restrictions to the first car. There was no um, airbag. There was no uh, seat belt on the first car. Um, those regulations came in much later. But you have to remember, to build the automobile, at least the first one, took, took a couple of weeks, months to get out. Then, then factories came and industrialized that. But it was still slow enough that we could actually monitor that progress. Sadly, AI, the cat's already out of the proverbial bag. It's moving faster than the people who created it. And the people who created it are even looking going, we don't know what to do because now our Google bot has learned faster than our own brains. And so usually when that happens, what that means is we actually we have actually lost a lot of control and ceded a lot of control to AI. Devastating thing about AI right now is AI is being used in all kinds of ways to, to create wars, to, to manipulate minds. And soon it will be manning our aircrafts, deciding our battles, deciding uh, uh, our, our, our strategic areas and locations and all that. And maybe even soon it'll be governing us. Who knows the sophistication of artificial intelligence. And so what I can honestly say is I think the church needs to form a think tank that makes them part of the solution. I think the church needs to start thinking about safe, safety guards and protocols. I know Elon Musk tried to create an ethics board for artificial intelligence, and then he, he sold it and broke it down and started to run with AI because sadly, when the AI race begins, it's like the space race. Everybody wants to be the first to get into space. They don't care what ethics they blow over to get there. And I believe it's actually on the church to create those ethical boundaries and to provide some kind of document, some kind of documentation. I say this in my, in my course on the boundaries with AI. I say, first of all, the proverbial cat's already out of the bag. Um, Amazon will be the first one to introduce that Amazon one thing you're talking about. But unfortunately, now that it's out the bag, they won't be the last. And again, we're going to find better ways to achieve those results you know so what do we do with that we i think we just have to now realize that age is upon us but how do we create those safeguards whilst the age is upon us you know i want i want to take a minute right now and i want to show this ai video that your team has developed so people can find out a little bit more and get some more information check out this video and we'll be right back in just a moment hey everyone tell me Rami here listen i have a brand new course called ai empowering christian to embrace the new digital age. We are now at the crux of a fourth industrial revolution. And every time in history, the church has caught a hold of technology. It has always been an accelerant to help them to redeem the time. And I know what you're thinking. AI has come to take over the world. They're gonna put neural links in our brains and turn us into faster working digitized mules. I wanna change your mind today and teach you that you can either use 
use the tool of AI or become a tool of AI. You've all heard me prophesy that we have seven years left, seven years before there's a reset, seven years before our finances as we know it changes forever. But the Lord told me we cannot successfully redeem the time without partnering somehow with AI to cut down what would have been done in seven years to literally do it in seven months, seven days, seven minutes, seven seconds. That's right. And not replacing artificial intelligence for divine intelligence. Divine intelligence is always going to remain supreme. But how do we work with AI? Just like how did Apostle Paul work with the Roman robes? How did Martin Luther work with the printing press? We are at the crux of a generational change, a change where we can actually preach the gospel to all creation or be a kingdom entrepreneur, a kingdom financier, or a kingdom business person for the Lord. Not only that, but I'm gonna give you special exclusive access to my AI top secret toolbox, where I show you some of the top AI tools that I'm using right now that's actually helping me redeem time and make things happen much faster. Whether you're a pastor of a church, or you're a business leader, or you're a single mom working her own entrepreneurial business and raising the kids at the same time, I wanna show you how you can actually buy back time to do the things you love, like read your Bible, pray, spend time with the Lord. Join this course today. It's gonna change your life forever, I promise you. Register now at the link in the bio. Seats are going fast. Hurry up and get yours. I'll see you soon. Outstanding. Prophet, thank you so much for this and this time. I've only got about a minute and a half or so left, so I, I want to give you a quick second just to clear, share some closing thoughts, but I want to thank you for joining with me here, and, uh, and just whatever God puts upon your heart, take about 30 seconds and uh, just give some closing remarks. Sure. I believe that um, the world, America, as we know it, is in a place of a great sea change. And the Lord is speaking expressly about raising a people prepared for the coming of the Lord. And it's programs like this that really help people to be positioned well to take advantage of the time. The one with the eyes of the future always has the greatest level of influence. And we see that with Joseph. It's not the most qualified. It's not the most brilliant. It's the one who can interpret the time well that has the greatest level of influence. And God wants to give you and equip you with that level of influence. And I just pray and I ask the Lord right now to open the eyes of your understanding, open your ears, to make you that Issachar people that know what time it is and know what the nations ought to do. That as you're positioning your ears to hear and your eyes to see, my biggest prayer is that you position your legs to move because it's time to move in Jesus name. Thank you so much, Prophet Tommy. Appreciate you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've been blessed by this, there's so many other shows that you can check out. Go to ctvn.org or our YouTube page to get more of Signs of the Times. We are encouraging you, stay up to date with the prophetic now. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.